Jean-Marie Leclerc was arguably the last in a long line of great French composers who attempted to come to terms with the huge difference in style between French elegance and Italian bravura. In fact, he could equally be described, as contemporary critics said, to be the first person who, without imitating anything, created beautiful and new things which he could call his own. His music demonstrates the best of Italian virtuosity integrated with the subtleties of the French tradition, but his personal life is less easily catalogued. His family were respected lace makers, and this was his first occupation. Dancing was also an important part of their life, and he began his professional career as a dance master before his meteoric rise as violinist and composer. The rest apart from dates of his movements around Europe, is sketchy. His death is well documented, but not the reason for it, nor who caused it. For these reasons, I've invented an imaginary scenario which takes place in Paris on October 23rd, 1764. Based on the facts that I've been able to glean from the dark mirror through which we look at history, there are a few stories which can be repeated. So, with your indulgence, I'll present a quasi-fictional account of his life and death. It is a cold, late autumn morning, in one of the seedier areas of Paris. Lully has been dead for over 77 years, Couperin for 33, and Rameau for just over a month. There remains but one Frenchman famous enough to carry on the proud tradition of French music and dance. Jean-Marie Leclerc is that man, a violinist whose technique and compositional skill rivals the best of the Italians. He has, towards the end of an illustrious career, fallen from favour. His two servants are walking slowly to the house. Gardner and valet, they discuss his current predicament as they walk, remembering his past and the people who have described him in the most glowing of terms. He used to be so well loved. Remember when they described him as the first among Frenchmen in his mastery of bowing? No. A rival to the great Rameau in his <laughs> harmony. This was a man whose manner had been described as sober, but this discretion had nothing to do with timidity. It came from an overabundance of good taste rather than a lack of boldness or freedom. Sober? <laughs> well, that's a joke. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what made them change their minds. Ooh, nothing to do with his vile temper or his jealousy, <laughs> that's for sure. He had for some years been separated from his second wife. The relationship had become unbearably bitter, and he finally left the comfortable apartment paid for with his hard-earned money to take up residence in this rather dingy house in a disreputable part of Paris. But he got his own back on the shrew, didn't he? The whole of Paris knows that the evil sorceress in his opera was based on the ungrateful witch. <laughs> yes. And he went one better by having Scylla turn her into a foul monster, <laughs> banished forever to dwell in the depths of the underworld. <laughs> that was a scary moment. Well, in the opera, I mean. Uh, when Scylla calls up the gods to help her cast the spell, the whole place went dark, and I swear real flames were licking around the orchestra pit. Uh, uh, what were the words? And you, whose conflagration renders the surrounding fields arid and smouldering, Etna. Look favourably on my spells, so that in the horror of the darkness, darkness, the flames that are thrown up may increase the terror of the funereal mysteries that I am about to begin.
Remember how the fiddles paint the flames while the basses go down, down, down to hell. <laughs> Dark divinities of the infernal shore, come out and reveal yourselves to us. Come, disturb the peace that reigns on Earth. Scylla Iglaucus was Leclerc's only opera, but in every way it equaled the works of Rameau. His orchestral writing incorporated aspects of his virtuosic technique, and his musical imagery was equally imaginative. But it was a very different style of composition to that which is generally associated with Leclerc. We know that he was a talented dancing master and worked in that capacity at courts and households in both France and Italy before he became known for his violin playing. The dance forms of the French and Italian courts, the courant, the gig, minuet, sicilienne, gavotte, and their associated rhythmic patterns and structures can all be found in his sonata movements. The sixth sonata in his book one, although it has Italian titles, is actually a French suite with the movements clearly recognizable as an allemand, a courant, a gavotte en rondo, and a gig. I saw him dancing the other day. Dancing and playing the fiddle at the same time. Well, he hasn't done that for a while. Of course, that's how we started off, teaching the Italians in Turin how to turn a minuet without falling ass over tit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny, though. He was smiling and gesturing as if someone was with him and he seemed happy. Yeah, it must be ages since the last time I saw him crack anything but a grimace. What was he dancing? Uh, a Sicilian. Oh, Marie Rose. He was thinking of his first wife. Now she could dance. Pretty too, but died young. She liked the Italian dancers. He was playing and smiling and dancing away, and I swear I could hear the harmonies as well as the tune. As if another fiddler was in the room as well. Of course, he learned that trick from our French viol players with their double stops. And that's why he got so famous. Combined all the flashy tricks from the Italians with the sophistication of the French. And that's why they call him the French Corelli. First Frenchman to beat the Italians at their own game.
To be compared to Corelli was high praise indeed. Corelli's works, exclusively for the violin, changed the perception of that instrument in France, bringing it from the dance hall into the courts and theatre. Leclerc's sonatas and concerti continued that development and demanded a mastery of double stopping, that is, playing more than one note at a time, and bowing techniques barely seen in France at that time. It is known that Leclerc used the longer Tartini bow, perhaps as a result of his studies with the Italian violinist Giovanni Battista Solmus. This would have enabled him to develop the bowing techniques which are a feature of his sonatas. The rapid string crossings, longbow staccati and fast repeated notes, however, were never allowed to overshadow the elegance of his cantabile melodies. It was during a visit to the court at Kassel that Leclerc performed with Italian violinist and composer Pietro Locatelli. Jakob Wilhelm Lustig, a German organist and theorist, wrote an account of this contest between the two violinists, a battle between the French and Italian styles. Lustig stated that Leclerc played like an angel and Locatelli like the devil. That Leclerc employed extreme rhythmic freedom and moved his listeners by the beauty of his tone, while Locatelli astonished his listeners with a deliberately scratchy sound and left-hand pyrotechnics. There was another violinist who had an intense rivalry with Leclerc. Remember the last time Pierre Guignon was around? Uh, when they were still both sharing the number one spot in the King's Band. <laughs> one month playing first fiddle, then the next month playing second. They were sitting down quietly playing duets together and Guignon whispers something about him playing a note out of tune. Aha! And suddenly there's our boss beating him around the ears with his bow, knocked his wig off and there's Guignon bald as a coot. <laughs> and Guignon's <laughs> mistress sitting there watching. I hear Guignon has borne a grudge ever since, said if he ever came near him, he'd kill him. On guard! <coughs> Suddenly the gardener lifts his staff and with a cry forces the valet to raise his own in self-defence. A mock battle commences to the delight of passers-by.
The approach of a gendarme puts an end to our servants' merriment, but the officer still insists on questioning them. On hearing that they are in the employ of Monsieur Leclerc, all is well, and the two continue down the road. Oh. Thirsty work, this is dueling. Yes. Uh, cognac? Ah. Although the story just related is a fabrication, the rivalry was not. Leclerc couldn't bear the thought of playing second fiddle to Guignon and resigned his position at the French king's court. With his second wife, Louise Roussel, a music engraver, he moved to Holland, where Princess Anne had invited him to play at the court of Orange. Princess Anne was the daughter of King George II of England and had studied the harpsichord with Handel. This seems to have been a happier time in Leclerc's life, and he stayed in Holland for ten years, performing and composing. A daughter was born, and his wife continued her profession by publishing his works. His fourth book of sonatas was dedicated to Princess Anne, and she reciprocated by conferring on him the Croix du Lion Néerlandais. In 1743, he returned to Paris, entering the court of the Duc de Grammont. If Leclerc says it's for a flute, it's for a flute. Did you hear about Corette's last set of sonatas? Uh, he says they were suitable for the flute, or the oboe, or the violin, or the hurdy-gurdy. Oh, hurdy-gurdy? I'd rather listen to you singing. But Corette writes for the opera comic, so, so what do you expect? Oh, Leclerc might be grumpy, but he's got integrity. Yes, but most of his pieces are for the fiddle. Except for that one, he says can be played on the oboe as well. He wrote something for the oboe? <laughs> That's rich. I heard him once say that the oboe is an ill wind that nobody blows good. Gasso! <laughs> <laughs> cognac! Do you think we should? Oh. He's still asleep. He's getting rid of last night's collection of bile. <laughs> Strange, though, isn't it? When he's playing, he's like a different person. Yes. Quiet, controlled, <laughs> every note like a perfectly formed pearl. And what a sound. Yeah. And his rhythm, as if he's dancing, even when he's perfectly still. Leclerc was a perfectionist. He wouldn't publish works until he was satisfied. Many that he felt weren't good enough ended up in the fire. He was also particular about finding the right instrument for a work and insisting that it was played as written, without ornamentation. Most of the sonatas were for his own instrument, the violin. He was also very particular about the manner in which his compositions were to be performed. He disagreed with the common Italian practice of performers including elaborate ornamentation, such as trills and turns. In the foreword to his fourth book of sonatas, Leclerc wrote, An important point, which cannot be emphasised too much, is to avoid this confusion of notes which are added to melodic and expressive pieces, and which only serve to distort them. Any ornaments to be played in the slow movements were always written out or otherwise indicated. Leclerc also wrote, I forgot to mention that by marking a piece allegro, I'm not indicating a fast speed, but a gay quality. Those who play too fast, especially in character pieces, like most fugues in common time, give a trivial expression to the melody, rather than preserving its distinction. Thank you.
It is interesting that contemporary sources often describe Leclerc as difficult, touchy, unstable and misanthropic. His relationship with his five brothers and two sisters, nephew and his second wife, were all difficult. One assumes they pressured him to help them find positions at court, although none of them had achieved Leclerc's mastery of the violin. His younger brother, Jean-Marie Leclerc, Le Cadet, had some success as a composer of violin pieces, but nothing of any merit. His nephew, Guillaume Francois Vial, commented after Leclerc's death, he only got what he deserved, having always lived like a wolf. His estranged wife didn't even attend his funeral, although she did publish one set of his sonatas posthumously. Well, let's face it, no one can play like he can. Even now, he's still a cut above the rest. I guess if you're the forgotten brother, eking out a measly income on meagre talents, you're going to be a bit um, blue about it. I once heard him trying to play one of the boss's sonatas. Oh, criminally bad. And in public, too. No wonder the old man won't give him the time of day. <laughs> Which sonata was it? Uh, I think it was the first one out of the ninth book. One of the, the really tricky ones, full of those fancy techniques. Having left the inn, the two servants returned to their master's house, entering through the garden. What's this? This isn't good. That's his hat. And there's his wig. And look, the front door's open. Something bad is going on here. Neighbours, hearing the cries of alarm, rush out to see what's going on. Load of I'm going inside. Quick, run back and grab that gendarme.
With the arrival of the law, they step into the house to find the master face down in the hallway. Heart attack? Stroke? The gendarme steps back, and the crowd can finally see the manner of this great virtuoso's demise. The valet is first to speak. His best shirt. Made it himself all those years ago. Finest piece of lace I ever saw. The others only have eyes for the pool of congealing blood. Stabbed three times in the back. The wounds clearly visible through the torn cloth of his coat, underneath which are the remains of one of the finest examples of a lace maker's art. Leclerc, to the last, impeccably dressed to join Corelli, Lully and Rameau at Parnassus, the resting place of the gods. Thank you.